So we'll spend all this week and beyond to talk about the unveiling of these memorandum of understanding between the healthy banks and the unhealthy eight. Of course, there are a lot of understanding, understanding the MOUs itself, and not just the memorandum of understanding, but the entire process that will lead to what you call a safe harbor for these institutions. Of course, the Access Bank has made the announcement and the market has since reacted very positively to this uh, very important development in the country's banking history, at least since the August of 2009. Okoyemi Agbaje is the CEO at Resources in Trust Limited and is a marks and analyst is joining us live in the studio. Good morning. Uh, thanks for coming through, sir. We appreciate your time at this very important uh, point. Uh, let's start with the broad okay, lifeline between Lifeline and the Safe Harbor. Um, we've had a Lifeline for close to two years. Mm -hmm. Now we're heading towards a Safe Harbor. The one who led us through the Lifeline is the Central Bank, the financial regulator. Now the, it needs to hand over to the healthy banks to lead the unhealthy banks to a Safe Harbor. We can keep this Lifeline uh, perpetually forever. forever. That's your view, is it? Cl clearly, it's not, it cannot be a permanent solution. Um, if, if the central bank is going to be the one contributing equity to the sustenance and survival of those banks on a permanent basis, then it, it would have to become the owner of those institutions, which we don't want. We want a private sector controlled bank. So clearly, it's in the interest of the financial system, the interest of the economy, for a permanent sustainable solution. And I think that solution uh, um, is in some form of acquisition or capital injection or merger or whatever that replaces the CBN contributed uh, funding with sustainable capital. In this case, I, I, I think private sector capital. Mm, IMOU is a little bit like a, uh, a gentleman's agreement, mm -hmm. a little bit like mm -hmm. one step ahead or above a gentleman's, what they call a handshake across mm -hmm. the table. So, um, well, let's understand this MOU safe harbor process. Uh, the MOU is not legal, but of course is a declaration of intent, uh, what you could may call an expression of interest. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, but it still provides us a signal that all is well and all would be well for the rescue institutions, isn't it? It, it provides a framework for, conc I mean, it, it indicates that the parties have agreed on a transaction in principle, but then it establishes a framework through which hopefully they hope they intend to proceed to concluding that transaction. In this case, which would be a merger. But of course, you know that with this type of transactions, they need all sorts of approvals. They need SEC approvals, stock exchange approvals. They need the shareholder approvals. They have the extraordinary general meeting. They need the federal court approval. So the framework, the MOU simply establishes that, yeah, we intend to go through this process. Mm -hmm. But we recognize that there are several steps that we need to take to get into okay, getting an MOU together, you are a, a one-time banker. I'm sure you still have interest in banking, perhaps some other day you mm -hmm. could come around to administer one of the uh, other banks. So uh, the the key, one of the key issues that we need to look at is this uh, issue regarding the MOU itself. Before you arrive at an MOU, that means you've done due diligence. You've you've, due you've diligence. seen what you call strengths, and we've done what you call SWOT analysis. And yeah. Access Bank directors and, and Mahmoud Alabi and the rest of his team at, at the continental was I said, look, this looks like a very good marriage. Uh, we're just going for the introduction party, as it were. And that Clearly, was there, are, there are significant complementarities. Um, Access Bank is a very strong corporate bank. It has a strong corporate and institutional arm. On the other hand, uh, the intercontinental team, intercontinental bank provides a bigger retail structure, a bigger branch network, a strong corporate and institutional uh, banking group as well. Um, Access Bank is positioned internationally, but perhaps can benefit from the domestic retail franchise and the, and the consumer commercial banking franchise in Intercontinental Bank. The two of them can leverage a higher earnings efficiency. They can be more efficient across the country and across the world. So clearly, yeah, there are, there are complementarities. There is a match, I think, in which the combined entity suddenly has a formidable branch network, a formidable e-commerce network, 
a formidable um, um, corporate and institutional banking franchise. And so for, for both sides, I suspect that it should be a win-win. What, what economic and market disaster will happen if we keep these rescued institutions continuously on federal government lifeline? These are taxpayers' money, mm -hmm. and these have run into trillions of naira between the CBN injection uh, and the AMCON and, and what have you and those interbank guarantees and all that? Actually, for me, for, as an independent analyst, the most important part of this to me and to the rest of the MOUs that may be signed in the future is the systemic benefits. You have, first of all, we should understand the options. It's either you convert that, those institutions into government banks, which for me is a complete no-no. We want a deregulated private sector bank because they're being sustained right now by government funding. Or we liquidate them or we get some credible person to inject equity. Now, liquidation is a loss for everybody, employees, investors, and the depositors, most importantly. And even if you chose to liquidate, then the NDIC would have to underwrite depositors' funding, which is, again, a call on taxpayers' funding. On, on taxpayers uh, and uh, national not sure whether NDIC even has enough money. Exactly. To cover so the budget would have to support that process. So we needed we need a rational market led solution that resolves the systemic implications. And remember, Intercontinental Bank was is systemically important. It had two hundred seven billion exactly. naira deposit. It's a major a institution. Money. It had before the intervention more than five percent of the industry's Market assets share. and deposits. Mm. So it's not an institution that you can ignore and say let's mm. do an orderly liquidation of this process. It's not an so option. too big to fail. Announcement Precisely. that let me just and see the central bank chief made on August 15, 2009, was was a very good one. At the at very least, in respect of Intercontinental, Oceanic, and Union Bank, which was and then Bank PHB in the second round, which were systemically important banks. Maybe you could have that option with a few others of the of the group, but certainly we, not with those four. Mm. So uh, Access Bank is the white knight right mm. now uh, in the movie. Uh, see, they call Safe Harbor. <laughs> this has been right now and just appeared to take intercontinental to, to a civil. But let's take a, one quick look at what Mahmoud al administration has been able to do close to two years. How, how would you rate uh, Mahmoud al uh, uh stay in office? Well, um, I think that um, they have preserved, if you look at uh, some of the figures available, they have preserved the viability of the institution. And um, that's a credit both to them and to the central bank for its support. And, and, and the systemic, I mean, ensuring that the market did not crash, cave in, run, run on, I mean, and carry out a run on those institutions mm. because that could easily have happened. So, yeah, they have sustained the viability of the bank without which perhaps this transaction would not be happening and um, retained its customer base, which is remarkable given the circumstances. Um, that was well known to the general public. They may have lost some customers in the higher ends of the market, the much more sophisticated investors, but by and large, they preserve the companies, the bank's customer base, and therefore positions it for, for investors. So that's where I give more credit and the rest of his team, Herbert and the rest, are finding value in Intercontinental for this um, MOU. Clearly, there's significant value for Access Bank um, beyond the saving an institution and the systemic benefits. It's a win-win for the investors in Access Bank. They acquire a platform to ramp up profits, ramp up market share, increase the efficiency of their operations, and essentially become a top player, probably top five in the Nigerian banking sector. And then they have the muscle to, the Access Bank has grown internationally, has established significant presence across Africa. But now they have the domestic pillar of support, the funding base, the capital base, the bank network, from the Nigerian market, which remains the most important mm -hmm. in so, their so, operations. So access also needs in Kanaku Intercontinental Bank. In oh, sense of it, it's a win-win in my view. Oh, really? So no, 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 no victor, no vanquished mm -hmm. in the manner of speaking. But of course, there's still a leader of this gentleman's agreement. One person's handshake will be a little bit firmer than the other. But a lot of advantages there. So it makes so does it make sense? It, it makes sense. I've looked at all the stakeholders. It makes sense to the taxpayer, 
who would not have to support the bailout of the bank or the liquidation of the bank through the NDIC. Makes sense to the employees of both institutions, particularly the employees of Intercontinental Bank. They now have a sustainable <laughs> job. Investors of Intercontinental Bank at least salvage some investment. It might have diminished in value, but they get something out of it, which wouldn't happen if there had to be a liquidation. Um, the depositors also are sure that their money will not be lost. That's the depositors of Intercontinental Bank. On the Access Bank side, the investors and employees have an opportunity to build a larger, more efficient bank. Uh, were you surprised that the share price of Intercontinental rose yesterday on that news? Oh, it would have been surprising if it didn't rise. And that's an indication that the shareholders and the market understands that this is positive for Intercontinental Bank. Um, it means, like I said, that and provides a window, of course, which investors are exploiting because it means that if you are a shareholder of Intercontinental Bank, you know that the future is better than the current. And therefore, the, you, you, you know that your investment has at least salvaged some value. Mm. Uh, for analysts like, like yourself, uh, what does it bring to the table for you now trying to merge analyzing a bank with a strength in investment banking uh, and, and, and wholesale banking as an access and uh, uh, one with a very strong uh, uh, retail banking business like Intercontinental, but a very strong business development mm -hmm. unit? Well, like I said, it's, um, there's, it, those six complementarities are, are stark. They're obvious. Um, fortunately, we have IFRS, which allow us, I mean, so I'm also, I like the fact that this is coming at the time that we're going to have IFRS supporting, which means we can see the segment contribution. We can see what is the profits and the assets and the loans coming from the corporate side. We can see the retail side. We can see the commercial banking side. We can see the contribution of treasury and investment banking. So it will make it obvious shortly um, whether these synergies that we expect as analysts will be realized or are being realized, or whether those efficiencies are visible or not. Um, if we were in the old system in which those figures are lumped together, perhaps it would have taken much more rigor and difficulty establishing the benefits or, or the, the success of the merger. But it's going to be interesting, uh, with IFRS supporting, seeing the contributions from all of these sectors, and seeing, ascertaining, that our expectations for synergies and complementarities will be manifest or not. Mm. You think the selection process for this was fair, thorough, transparent? Well, um, um, I'm not an insider in that process. Um, my understanding from all I've heard is that it was competitive, it was fair. Intercontinental was clearly an attractive proposition, I believe, for several players. Um, so the fact that Access Bank's offer has been accepted suggests to me that the, 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 the shareholders and directors of of, of Intercontinental felt this was their best offer. But for me, I've had one or two memo, um, announcements, and I think this is a particularly attractive one. It looks, we know who the two parties are in full. Mm, mm. Un unlike, unlike perhaps a few others, which is uh, just a consortium. Yes, which are retail. funds, and then we need to look behind the funds to know who the parties are. To unveil are. Mm. the persons and all that, and institutions. Yeah. So this is a very clear one. Yes, uh, it's clear. access to the continent. Intercontinental. Uh, the two uh, uh, signboards that are just out there yeah. on the roadside for everybody. We so know you who know they where are. They're banking institutions. They're existing institutions. They have their own independent franchise. And in combining them, we know exactly what will come. Exactly so emerge. So it's a, it's a win-win situation. Mm. So it makes sense It to makes you. sense to me, yeah. All right. Thank you. We appreciate being here with us on the program. Apoyemi Agwaji, the Chief Executive Officer at uh, Resources and Trust Limited and a Market Analyst. Of course, a one-time banker as well. We'll talk to you in the days ahead.